Hello, and welcome to another episode of Adventures in .NET. We've got a really good show for you this week. I'm Sean Clavo, and with me on the panel is Caleb Wells. Hey, all. Hey, Carol. How you doing? Good. You? I'm doing real well, and I'm really excited about this week's episode. I'm not that much of an excitable person, but I got to tell you, this topic that we're going to cover this week is something that's really got me excited. So I think this is a really good thing. So our guest today is Daniel Roth. You want to say hi, Daniel? Hi, everyone. How's it going? It's great to be here. Good, good. Glad to have you. So Daniel's from Microsoft. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do there? Yeah, I, I, I work at Microsoft. I work on .NET. I'm currently on the ASP.NET team, our, our web framework for, for .NET developers. I work mostly on ASP.NET Core. And then most recently, I've been working on this new thing called Blazor. Blazor. Yeah, I love it. Can you tell us a little bit about Blazor, what it is, and uh, why uh, y'all started developing it? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I haven't actually been on ASP.NET for, for that long. I started out working on, like, managed networking for .NET and did some SOAP service stuff back in the day. But when I joined the ASP.NET team, uh, one thing that I learned is that uh, .NET has a great story for building web applications that run on the server. If you want to do like request reply style web applications where everything is rendered server side, we've got a whole buffet of, of frameworks that you can use. Web forms, MVC, Razor pages. But there's this other side to web apps, which is the client, the, the browser. You know, sometimes you would actually like to have that rich interactivity. Sometimes you'd like to actually use the resources on the client side of the wire. You know, they have CPU and memory and storage and a camera and GPS and who knows what else on their device. You probably would like to leverage that in your web application, which is fine. And for .NET developers, that meant, well, you have to write some JavaScript then because browsers historically have only ever run JavaScript which is kind of unfortunate because there's this whole like ecosystem of de- dev tools and frameworks that you can use on the server, but you can only use one on the, uh, on the client in the browser. And then this miracle happened, which is all these companies got together and said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we agreed on a way to run any code in a browser? And they defined this new open spec called WebAssembly which is like this low-level bytecode for the web. And all modern browsers support it. It's actually been out for a few years now. It's being um, um, more and more broadly adopted by a lot of fairly big sites. What took them so long? I, I, you know, it's, 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 it, was, uh, it requires some agreement, some, like, you know, <laughs> some people who maybe don't talk to each other as much, like getting in the same room. <laughs> all the browser vendors uh, thought this was a good idea, which was, a, which was fabulous. And so as long as you can compile your code, to WebAssembly, you don't usually write code in WebAssembly. Usually it's like a, a compilation target. Then it can now run in any browser and on any platform at near native speeds. And so this opened the door for .NET code to now be able to be run inside of a browser or any code really that you want, whether it's Java or Go or Rust or whatever your favorite platform is. And so we've been working pretty hard to make .NET in the browser a really good experience. And that's what Blazor was all about, is enabling you to do full stack web development with just .NET. You can write C Sharp instead of uh, writing JavaScript. If you still like JavaScript, that's, that's fine. You can still continue to do it. But for a lot of our developers, they seem pretty happy with the idea that they can reuse their, their, their skills, their tools, their build systems, their frameworks for the whole web application. That sounds great. C Sharp is, is my language of choice. I think the, the same with Sean. And for the company I'm working for, uh, all of our front end is in Angular. So right there, there is that that switch that that context that you have to keep in mind. And while TypeScript helps Angular be more object oriented, um, it's in in the end, it's still JavaScript, right? Yeah, um, and you know Microsoft loves JavaScript. Oh yeah, we yeah. we we have our our you know the 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 forefather of C sharp is working on on TypeScript and making TypeScript. TypeScript awesome. We do a lot of tooling for TypeScript with Visual Studio Code. This is just really about opening the door, creating opportunities so that, you know, if you want to write JavaScript or TypeScript, that's great. If you want to write in something else, you can now do that too. You can leverage any ecosystem that makes sense uh, for your particular application. So how does Blazor use WebAssembly? How does, how does that actually run in the browser? So what we do, it's kind of interesting. We, we don't actually take all of your C-sharp code and compile it directly to, to WebAssembly. We, we actually do have some tech now that, that can do that, 
But for most Blazor apps, the way they run today is not actually doing that. Well, instead, what we did is we just took the runtime, the part of .NET that knows how to run .NET IL, that does the garbage collection and memory management, all those types of things. We just took the, the runtime itself and built that in WebAssembly. And you download that with your application, and then you just download normal .NET assemblies, .NET IL, into the browser, and you execute it using that WebAssembly-based runtime. It's actually an IL interpreter-based model right now, so it's just interpreting the IL that comes out of the assembly. It's not doing any, it's not doing any JIT to okay. address performance uh, concerns. One, we are working on what we call ahead-of-time compilation from C Sharp to WebAssembly so that you can selectively pick at parts of your app that are more performance sensitive uh, and you can compile those things to WebAssembly as well. But at least for right now, Blazor is, is just a, a basically an IL interpreter, a .NET IL interpreter written in WebAssembly that executes your assemblies directly. Okay, cool. It's, it kind of freaks some people out a little bit when okay. they see it because you, you look at the network trays and you'll, you'll look at a Blazor app and you'll see what's being downloaded. And you'll see a little bit of like uh, bootstrapping JavaScript that gets downloaded that we provide that, that uh, is used to set up the, the WebAssembly runtime. You'll see the WebAssembly file, you know, a .wasm file. And then you see DLLs being downloaded into your browser. And, and some people kind of freak out and they're like, oh, no, like, is my, am I hacked? You know, is this, is this secure? <laughs> The thing to remember is all that code actually runs within the same browser sandbox that JavaScript runs. So you can't do anything more or less than what you could already do in JavaScript. So yeah, it is a little trippy to, to when you see it at first, but it is just normal DLLs. It means if you have like a library from NuGet or from your company or whatever that you just want to use with that app running in the browser, you can just reference it. And as long as it's a .NET standard uh, class library, for the most part, it will just work. That's going to be some serious magic dust stuff going on there. You know, what, you know, just putting the raw DLLs right in the browser and the WebAssembly just deals with it. So you could think of it as just like another platform. Like we, we have .NET running on Windows. We've had that for years. Uh, right. With .NET Core, we took .NET to, to run on a Mac or run on Linux and run on ARM devices. Those are all just different platforms that we had to create a runtime that could execute correctly on that platform and wire up all the .NET APIs to correctly know how to do networking on that platform, how to talk to the file system on that platform. The browser is just another platform. And so we implemented a runtime that now works on that platform. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the IL part of Blazor, C-sharp, is that running on mono talking to WebAssembly? So the, the runtime that we chose to implement yeah. in WebAssembly yeah. is actually the mono runtime. Okay. Uh, I mean, a, lot, a lot of people wonder, like, well, why are you using mono? Mono is actually the cross-platform client.NET runtime is one way I think about it. It can do other things okay. as well, but it's primarily used today for client scenarios like iOS, Android, Apple Watch, you know, all these scenarios where you need to have .NET code running on a device and you're really going to be running some UI we typically are using Mono for that uh, okay. today. So it was actually a pretty natural fit to bring to the browser. Browser scenarios are client scenarios, and Mono was already really set up from the beginning to be a cross-platform runtime, so the, the port was pretty natural. Okay, that's awesome. Fully supported by Microsoft. I mean, we, right, we, of course. We, Xamarin is part of our, 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 our .NET fold, so it's yeah. all really one, one .NET team. And, and we're doing things to try and you know, bring the mono and .NET Core and .NET you know, closer together so it really feels more like .NET. Maybe you saw uh, the announcements about .NET 5. Right. Uh, in, the, in the .NET 5 wave, we're trying to do a bunch of reconciliation about these various runtimes and the base class libraries. So it really starts to feel more like just one .NET. And you don't really think about like, oh, am I running on mono or am I running on .NET Core? It's just a runtime called .NET that can execute .NET IL. So it simplifies the, the naming and the marketing, so to speak. You don't have to reference this or that. It's all going to be .NET 5. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the, the marketing and the way you think about it will be a lot simpler. But yeah. also from an engineering perspective, there's a lot of uh, efficiencies and simplicity that we get out of it as well. I mean, I think it's uh, the movie Contact where someone jokes about building something. Why build one when you can build two for twice the price? Uh, <laughs> we don't really want to have two for twice the price if we don't right. need two. If we can just right. have one and make it great and put all our investment into it, that's, that's good for us and that's good for the .NET ecosystem as well because it enables us to build you know, better, greater uh, features. Absolutely. 
Could this be thought of as kind of like uh, the modern version, and I hate to say the word, silver light? In some ways, I, I, you know, we should be cautious as we make Very loosely analogy. concept, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Silverlight is similar in that it, it was a way for you to run .NET code in a browser. But Blazor is fundamentally different in a, in a few very important ways. The first is that Blazor re- is based purely on open standards. Like it do- um, Silverlight required a plugin. Like you had to extend right. the browser in order to be able to run .NET in the browser. With Blazor, there is no plugin, no extension you have to add to your browser. It just works with what's there. It's all open standards on, under the hood. It's HTML, it's CSS, it's WebAssembly. Uh, you don't have to. You're not doing anything proprietary. Blazor is also fully open source. Like everything we're doing in Blazor, from the application model with you know components and how you actually go about building your UI, all the way down to the runtime itself with Mono and, and the, the WebAssembly support. All of that stuff is open source. You know, the thing that people, a lot of people got bitten by with Silverlight was it got you know deinvested. I don't think that will happen with Blazor. I mean, I, I don't certainly not anytime soon. But um, even if it did, the community has got the code, and you can do whatever you want with it. Yeah. Uh, so that's really important. And then the the way you write your UI, Silverlight was a was a XAML based programming model. If you're right. a web developer, I think you'll find that that Blazor will feel much more natural because you're using web tech, you're using HTML, you're using CSS. The main thing you're swapping out is the the language. Instead of writing JavaScript, you get to write C sharp. Well, if I had an applause track, I'd be playing it right now. Woo, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a great, it's a super fun project to work on. I have to admit, like I I uh, I, I love working with the Blazor community. Like I hang out on uh, the Blazor Gitter channel as much as I can. That's uh, gitter.im slash aspinet slash Blazor. And there's just a bunch of folks there that do just amazing stuff with Blazor. They're building all sorts of component libraries and helper libraries and helping each other out. I think with Blazor, one of our goals is to be much more community driven. Like we want to create space where the community can really uh, innovate on top of Blazor, build great stuff on top of what we built. And so they feel like it can really flesh out that ecosystem. For people who aren't familiar with Blazor yet, or this may be the first time they've heard of it, you know, you're, the, we're talking about the difference between Silverlight and Blazor and the support. Blazor went from experimental to preview a couple of months ago, right? So, yeah. so it, it is now, it's, it's got a track, you know, there's, it's no longer playing around. You guys are um, getting into the nitty gritty. It is the real deal. Yeah, so that was interesting. Like that was a, a sort of a first time for me have, shipping this thing that we called experimental. Blazor's origins are kind of are kind of interesting. Like what happened was uh, there's a dev on our team named Steve Sanderson. Uh, he's the the author also of, uh, of a fairly popular JavaScript library called Knockout JS, okay. and he works on the ASP.NET team. He has this really nice skill set where he um, he knows .NET really well. Like he's an ASP.NET developer. But he also knows the JavaScript world pretty, pretty well. He handles a lot of our integrations that we do with ASP.NET and the like, SPA frameworks like Angular and React and those types of things. And he was doing a talk at NDC Oslo, I think it was, about two years ago. And it was a talk about things that browsers can do that maybe you don't know about. And he picked WebAssembly as one of the new techs in, in, that was up and coming in browsers that he wanted to show. And he was like, huh, you know, I wonder if I could get a .NET runtime working on WebAssembly. And he actually found a third-party .NET runtime. There's a project called .NET Anywhere, which is a really sort of small, lightweight uh, .NET IL interpreter. It was written by a guy at Google. I forget, I forget his name. But it was all written in C. And he just ran that C code base through the uh, Inscript and toolchain to generate WebAssembly from that runtime and got it working. He got Hello World working in the browser. And you know, I think for most of us at that point, you'd be like, Oh, I've got the most awesome demo already. Like this is this is going to blow people's socks off to show some C sharp code running in the browser. But that that's not Steve's style. Like Steve was like, "Huh, that's pretty cool. I wonder if I could now build like a little web framework uh, on top of this." So he then built a a .dot net uh, uh, almost like a I don't want to say port, but uh, inspired web, web UI framework uh, heavily based on React with components, and components can have state and parameters, so you can have reusable chunks of UI in a very simple and convenient way. And he, and he whipped that up together and got that working in, on top of that same runtime. And then he was like, oh, man, I wonder if I can get tooling to work with it, too. So he wrote all this stuff with the Razor tooling in Visual Studio because this whole component model was based on Razor syntax. Uh, Razor is uh, like a mixture of HTML and C Sharp uh, for doing dynamic rendering. 
And he got all the Visual Studio tooling to do like IntelliSense and completions for the components and all this great stuff. And that was his demo at NDC Oslo. And my boss and our, one of our architects was there, Damian Edwards and, and David Fowler, and their jaws dropped and their eyes popped open when they saw this demo that he did for his talk. And that's how Blazor was born. He called it Blazor. The name supposedly is a mixture of browser plus razor. And everyone's like, well, uh, where does the L come from? Like, there's no L in browser. And he's like, uh, oh, that's it's because of blockchain. Like it's no, he, 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 he says no. It's just because it sounded better. That's, but we always we always wonder that. So that's where it started, and we showed this to management at Microsoft. We're like, this looks pretty cool. Like we looks like maybe we could do a thing here, but there were still a lot of open questions about the feasibility of making it really good. Like this was still proof of concept code. You know, can, will it really feel like .NET? Will it be performant? Is the WebAssembly tech really going to be able to stand up to this type of uh, scenario? There were just those questions. Would anyone want it? Does anyone actually want to write C-sharp code in the browser? I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the JavaScript ecosystem that you would be, in some sense, competing with. And so we started this experimental phase, and we did it for like a year, where we just shipped regular updates to, to Steve's prototype with improvements and fleshing it out and working through the component model. And after we had uh, pretty good confidence that, yeah, people really do want this, and yes, we think we can solve all the technical problems. Oh, like debugging was another one. Like, how do you debug your C-sharp code, which is running in a browser on this WebAssembly runtime? We figured out ways to do that. And then after we had got that level of confidence, that's when we, we said, okay, it's no longer experimental. Let's put this on the path to ship. There was one other development that happened, which was the component model that was built for Blazor. It's actually decoupled from how the components where the pixels actually get drawn. Like the components all render into an in-memory representation of the DOM. And then Mm -hmm. the framework looks at what was previously rendered and what was just rendered and does a diff. And then the diff is what is actually then gets applied to the DOM by the framework. The components don't touch the DOM directly. And that's very similar to how a lot of the JavaScript frameworks work. But if you have that decoupling, that means the components can actually run wherever you want. And they can render to whatever you want. You can put them in a different process. And that's where this idea of a server-side Blazor came from, where we actually have a model where you run the components on the server and all the UI events get sent to the server over a SignalR connection, over like a WebSocket. And then the components run on the server. They do their normal DOM diffing thing and then send the UI diff back to the client. And then the client, uh, the, the little bit of JavaScript from the Blazor framework applies those diffs to the UI and the client. That model is going to actually go ahead and ship in .NET Core 3.0 later this year, like in September. The reason why it gets to ship earlier is because it doesn't actually have any WebAssembly dependency at all. You get to use the same components. You still get that interactive feel of like a spa-style app, but it doesn't have any WebAssembly dependency, which is really the area that needs the most work right now. Like really making sure the mono support for WebAssembly is, is good is what we still need a little bit more time for. So the server model is going to go first in .NET Core 3.0, including all of the component model work that we did for, for Blazor. And then as soon as the WebAssembly runtime is done, then the uh, client-side model, the WebAssembly model, will then ship. And we expect that will be relatively soon thereafter. You know, months, not, not years after that, that happens. I'm somewhat optimistic, you know first quarter, first half of next year. That's, that's, yeah. that's been, I've been telling people as my, my, my guess, my crystal ball guess, that's not a commitment. So don't go planning some, <laughs> some product around that. But that's, uh, that's what we're, uh, um, where I'm currently uh, thinking that we'll be able to land. But so uh, you'll be able to build Blazor apps in production, though, with the server-side model in, starting in September. So the server-side kind of works like the old update panel? Very similar, yes. There have been a lot of jokes internally about, yeah, it's like it's Update Panel all over again. Update Panel was this component in web forms, right, where oh. it had a very kind of similar type of feel. Yeah, server-side Blazor is, has a lot of similarities to the, to the Update Panel model. I mean, it brings a lot more to the table with the whole com- component model and has a JavaScript interop model and all these things. But yeah, if, you, if you're familiar with Update Panel, you might look at Blazor and be like, okay, I kind of know what this is. Yeah, Caleb and I have been around pretty much since the beginning of .NET. So we've kind of seen the whole life cycle with web forms and view state and MVC and web API and SignalR and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, we, we kind of draw our memories from those things and go, oh, 
it, things kind of going in full circle, but a lot better, <laughs> a lot better. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, the old ADO.net days where uh, you write all the plumbing and you spend, you know, majority of your time plumbing and then the one piece that actually gets the data. So uh, that, that's an aside. But uh, I really like, right, where Microsoft is taking .net. And, you know, Sean is big on Blazor. And the people that I know that really know Blazor and been following it, they're like diehard. Like, you know, this, <laughs> this is going to be the end-all, be-all. I honestly felt the same way about that net core, what Microsoft did to start over, right? Basically, and build it in in a better way that's going to reach more people. I just I love it. So. Uh, I, I still remember the first time I got to do a demo on stage with a Mac, yeah. .NET code. Yeah. Like, like we build an app on Windows, and then like I put it like on a thumb drive and gave it to someone who had a Mac and said like, here, run this. And it runs seem, uh, you know, seamlessly on their, on their, their Mac or on Linux. It's pretty cool. It's, it's actually surprising how many, how many folks actually still don't, don't know that that is the case, that .NET is not a Windows-only thing anymore. Right. It's a cross-platform, open-source framework. You know, get the word out. Tell, tell your friends that this is, this is what's happened. It's, it's uh, pretty amazing. I worked on .NET for Windows for years and years, and it is so much fun now working on .NET. Like, everything we do is open and transparent. The code right. can run anywhere. Like, there's no place, really, at this point that you can't run some of your, your, your .NET code. People want to do this. They want to run C Sharp in the browser. And I think it was three or four years ago, I was at a .NET conference, and they had a panel up there. And I asked the question, do you think there's going to be a day where we can write things that run in the browser that's not JavaScript? Because a lot of people just really don't care for JavaScript. And they said, no, 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 no. Not going to happen. Too many security issues. <laughs> I'm glad that they were proven wrong on that. So. I am too. I had some similar conversations in that, but even in the early days of Blazor, I think there was a lot of people that weren't sure. I mean, that's one of the reasons why it was experimental. People weren't sure if trying to do something other than JavaScript was really practical or even desired. And so it, w- it was really helpful to get all the feedback from the community with people trying it out and letting us know that this was a, they found this really compelling, that this was something that they uh, would really like to have. Actually, we, we even had people who were non.NET developers that we talked to that it was interesting to see their level of excitement with Blazor. And it was typically people who are maybe not running .NET, but they also live in this mixed world. Like maybe they're doing PHP on the server or or Java, or Python on the server, but they also have to do the JavaScript thing on the client. And having to, to bridge those two worlds has just got a, got a lot of overhead for, for a bunch of folks. It's, it's not dissimilar, I think, in my mind, to, to asking someone to learn a new, a new human spoken language. Like, you know, okay, you, you speak English, now go learn Korean and be, become proficient in Korean. And that just takes, a, you can do it, you can probably say, hello, my name is, and where's the bathroom pretty quickly, but to become fluent and proficient in a, in a language like that, it takes, takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of investment to know both worlds, both the Node and JavaScript tooling world and the .NET world. For a lot of devs, that's, that's quite a bit. So it's, it's nice that you can take one skill set and use it end-to-end. These days, right, a lot of people have to be a full-stack developer or to in some, some extent, right? Because especially in smaller companies, you're going to be dealing with everything from SQL to c Sharp to maybe Angular, right? And I can see Blazor and WebAssembly simplifying that and solving, solving that problem where you need to know necessarily all these uh, multiple languages just to get going. Do you see any other um, solutions or problems that Blazor can solve for an end user? What do you see Blazor being able to do in a year, two years? Yeah, so this is actually where I get really excited. <laughs> so, so Blazor is right now about the web, right? Like we, right. we have a great story on the server for .NET when running web apps. We didn't really have anything for a client. And now we do. Now you can do both sides of the wire for your web applications. And we have a, 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 what we think is a really nice and productive component model for building your UI, great tooling experience in Visual Studio and in Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio for Mac is coming soon as well. But it's actually not just about the web. Like once you have this great component model that can do web technologies, then you can take it to play any place that knows how to render HTML and CSS. So for example, let's say you want to write mobile and desktop applications. Well, you could use Blazor to build uh, what is often called like hybrid style apps, 
where you run the .NET code natively on the device. So if you're on a desktop machine, you could run the Blazor components in a .NET Core process. If you're on a mobile device, you could run it on the, the, the Xamarin runtime, which is, uh, I believe it's mono under the, under the covers. But those components can still render to some sort of web view, to some sort of browser. In the case of desktop apps, you can imagine that being like, say, Electron. Electron is essentially a browser, a Chromium shell embedded with a desktop application. So now you can write cross-platform desktop apps using .NET code and web technologies. If you do a similar thing on uh, mobile devices, uh, like what you could do with, uh, say, Cordova or Ionic, you can imagine writing cross-platform mobile applications that run on Android and iOS, again, using web tech. And there you can actually reuse the same web UI assets that you're using in your website which could be a big cost savings for you. Oh, okay, yeah, I can see that. We actually have yeah. some public samples already of the uh, Electron model. Like if you want to try out building a, a Blazor Electron app uh, in our ASP, ASP Labs repo in the ASP org on GitHub, uh, there's a sample app there where we've prototyped like, oh, we, we could build an Electron app doing, uh, doing Blazor with .NET Core. Uh, and in that, in, that, in that world, the .NET code, because it's running on .NET Core just on the machine, it can do all the normal stuff. It doesn't have the constraints of the browser sandbox. You can you know, write to the file system. You can access the network, all those things that you would expect to be able to do from .NET. That in a Blazor WebAssembly app, you have to live with the constraints that the browser has imposed on you because you know, you're, you're some random code that got downloaded off of the internet. But then if you look even further and you'd be like, well, okay, so Blazor can do web rendering. But one of the nice things about the architecture of Blazor is that it's decoupled from HTML. Blazor components, they render to like basically elements and attributes, but how those elements and attributes then get turned into pixels, it can be changed. And so you can imagine writing a Blazor app, again, with components, same component model, but instead of writing HTML, you could use an abstraction that then maps directly to native controls. Like you could actually use the native iOS buttons and list views and so forth, or the Android native controls, or any other native stack that you want. One of the really cool demos that Steve Sanderson did at the most recent NDC Oslo, this was you know, two years later, two-year anniversary of him uh, uh, birthing Blazor at that, at that conference, he showed a prototype that he had done where he took Blazor and uh, had the, uh, extended the rendering layer to render to Flutter controls instead of HTML. So he basically wrote a Flutter app. Flutter is normally done with, uh, with Dart, with the Dart right. language. But he wrote his Flutter app using C Sharp and Razor Syntax and the Blazor programming model. And he had like a Flutter desktop app <laughs> running on his machine, which is, let me be clear, that's not something that we have any like immediate plans to, to ship, but it, it just highlights how the, the same app model can then be taken to not just to web, not just to hybrid scenarios, but also to, to native application scenarios. Very similar to how, say, React Native works today, mm-hmm. uh, or even Xamarin Forms does very similar, but, uh, something very similar, but with a, a, a XAML-based markup. So the possibilities really are endless for, yep. for, for what you can do. You could do it all with, with a, a single programming model. And I, what I really like about it is that it appeals, it's designed to appeal to a web developer audience. Like if you're a web developer and you know the web tech, Blazor is, is intended for you. And it will not only enable you to hopefully be more productive with your web app development, but also to do in the future, we hope, mobile and desktop development. Yeah, this would be great for like Chromebooks, things that are kind of low powered, you know, really. Yeah. With Chrome, like imagine you do um, like a Blazor progressive web app, a Blazor PWA. You can take the Blazor, a Blazor WebAssembly based app, add the normal, you know, service worker and uh, the manifest files, you know, all the, the the extra goo that you need to turn it into a PWA. And now it's it's a PWA. You can put statically host it someplace and uh, install it as a progressive web app on a Chromebook. That would totally work as well. That's awesome. Wow. So is, uh, is Blazor core only, or can you use it on full, full framework as well? The Blazor component model comes from, comes from core. Like the, the component model ships in .NET core. But okay. depending on where it's hosted, you may be running on a different runtime. So if you're doing a Blazor server app, then you're going to be running on .NET core. If you're doing a Blazor WebAssembly app, the code is actually going to be running on Mono, on the WebAssembly implementation of, of Mono. What you do on the server with a Blazor WebAssembly app, you can do whatever you want. It doesn't even have to be .NET. You could have PHP or Python on the server. As far as a 
Blazor WebAssembly app is concerned, it doesn't even know what's, what's happening on the server. It's completely decoupled. You can deploy a Blazor WebAssembly app as a bunch of static files on a static file hosting solution, just like you could an Angular or a React application. We do a thing where we run Blazor on mobile devices, like on iOS and Android. I expect that we would use the, the uh, .NET support from Xamarin in, the, in, those app, in those applications to run the Blazor components. So it's, it really depends. I mean, this is all that one .NET story, right? Like you write .NET standard code, and then it can run on any of the .NETs, as long as, because it's just talking to the same uh, standardized set of, of APIs and uh, API surface area. So my current application is a mixture of, of web forms, MVC, web API, all that kind of stuff. Could I add Blazor into that and then start migrating some of my pages from that I have in web forms over into Blazor and have them all run in the same, same application? Yeah, so that's, that's even a, uh, probably a deeper question because like, this sounds like it's a .NET Framework app, right? Like it's all, these yes. are all .NET Framework technologies. There's not even .NET Core in the picture at all. In order to get Blazor code involved there, well, if you want to just do pure client-side stuff with Blazor, right. uh, well, that would be like you adding, say, Angular or React to, to your applications. And you would do it the same way. You would just set up Blazor as a bunch of static assets that you, download, you, you, that you, you set it up to download from your application, and then you can use those components anywhere in the HTML DOM that you want that code won't care what's running on the server. The fact that it happened to be, the HTML happened to be rendered by a web forms you know, page, it doesn't even know. Yeah, um, so I want to do server side. If you want to do server side, now you're in this world of trying to do a hybrid .NET framework and .NET Core app. Server side Blazor is a .NET Core only technology. It doesn't run on .NET framework. That was actually one of the, the big changes that happened in .NET Core 3.0. Uh, mm-hmm. Prior to .NET Core 3.0, ASP.NET Core supported running both on .NET Core and on .NET Framework. And we did that because we knew a lot of people had .NET Framework apps and code, and they, but they still wanted to use this new web framework. In .NET Core 3.0, we've moved now to, to say ASP.NET Core is, is going to be .NET Core only. We're at the point where we think .NET Core has enough of the API surface area implemented that it's really our, the, the, sort of the future that we want to carry forward. When we talk about .NET 5, actually, .NET 5, you really can think of as like .NET Core 4, or maybe if we, but we just skipped a version and we dropped right. the core. .NET 5 is really a statement that uh, .NET Core is the, is the run t- uh, runtime that we're going to carry forward. It doesn't mean that .NET Framework goes away. Your .NET Framework apps will continue to be supported. They'll still get, continue to get incremental updates and improvements, but all the innovation really is happening in on, the, on the .NET Core side. Uh, and so we'll be putting more of our investment dollars, I guess, on, on, on that uh, on that train. So when you're talking the server side setup, right? It's your razor razor pages with uh, I'm I'm assuming the same kind of um, code that you would have in a CSA, CSHTML file for MVC, right? And then your C sharp code in the same file, right? Talking to each other. How does that transfer the client? So on the client, it's not downloading DLLs. None of that's none of that's going up. How are they? How are they talking back and forth? Um, yeah. and how are you managing that that connection? That's that's a great question. So with a a Blazor server app, the way way it works, you actually do see a little bit of Razor pages in that app. There is a mm-hmm. a host CSHTML file, and that's the file that's just responsible for for rendering the the page and marking basically where do you want your your component to to live on that page. So that's where you would set all your you know head metadata for for the HTML page. In that page, you set up a, the template will have a script reference to the blazor server.js file. And that's a, a, a piece of JavaScript that we provide for you that when downloaded along with the HTML to the browser, it has inside of it the SignalR client. And it will set up a SignalR connection back to the server to a, a component hub that the framework uh, provides for you. You don't, you don't see it, but you just say in your application that you'd like to use server-side Blazor, and under the covers, we're setting up a, a SignalR hub. So the client then connects to that hub, and then what happens is the initial render will occur. So the components that you have, you have implemented for your app, they will then render, and when they render all the... The, the DOM information about what it wants to render will get serialized through the SignalR connection down to the client and gets applied to the DOM by the, uh, the client-side JavaScript piece. Now, when you then have UI interactions, like if you have buttons and text boxes in that UI that you just rendered, every UI event then gets sent 
to back to the server over that same SignalR connection, you know, effectively a WebSocket connection, and the, the hub runs, it finds the right component for handling that event, the component executes, it renders, and now it's, it does that diff that I described earlier, where it, it calculates okay. the difference from what it rendered before and what it now needs to render, and then it just serializes the diff back down to the client, and the, uh, the JavaScript code will then apply that diff to, to the UI. So this, this is kind of like a, a thin client model. Like you're just basically treating the browser as something that can render pixels, something that knows how to send the user action someplace and knows how to apply the, the, the updated pixels to, to the screen. So the benefits are that the, like the load time of the app is very quick. Like you're not having to download very much. You're not having to download a full WebAssembly runtime and a whole bunch of DLLs to get it up and going. All you need is that little piece of JavaScript which sets up the, the connection. So it loads much faster. The component code is running on the server, so it's very powerful and feature-rich. Like if, it, if you want your component to talk directly to your database, you can do that. Anything you can do in .NET Core, you can do now from the, that component code. All the normal .NET features of debugging work just as they always have because it's just .NET Core. A lot of people also like that their code stays on the server. Some developers get a little concerned that if their DLL is being downloaded to the client, they'll, they ask me questions like, wait a minute, does that mean someone can just like decompile it and, the, and they can see my code? And I think for most web developers that are familiar with JavaScript, that it's like, yeah, that's how the client stuff usually works. But for a lot of .NET devs that are used to doing everything server-side, that can be a little disconcerting. Maybe you have um, uh, you know, IP or proprietary stuff in that code that you don't want exposed. The server-side Blazor model is kind of nice that way, that all your code just stays uh, on the server and never leaves. Yeah, and so those are the, the, the... Am I missing? I feel like I'm missing one of the... I talked about... Well, there's one other benefit um, in there. I can't remember. But yeah, go ahead. Well, something that you mentioned, right, is being able to talk to the database directly. So I'm assuming in that case, right, that you're not dealing with JSON in any form or fashion. If you're doing authentication, you're not dealing with JOTS. You're not... All that's going to be handled on the back end, which is... Yes. And that's had Thank for you. forever. Right? <laughs> yes, that was the third one. The third okay. one is that the architecture gets somewhat simplified because when you want to get data, well, you're already on the server. So you just get the data. You don't have to like set up an API and then make HTTP calls to the API, which then talks to the data. So you can, you can get some uh, application simplicity from the server side model. If you, if you want to have UI that is kind of real time, that's updating real time with stuff that's happening on the server, that's trivial to do with a Blazor server app. You just have your component, you know, listen on some event, that uh, says, you know, hey, here's some new data. Go render this. The component renders and whoosh, it just flies along the SignalR connection and you're done. You don't even have to set up SignalR yourself for those real, uh, some of those um, point-to-point real-time scenarios. Okay. But there are downsides. So the yeah. downsides of the server model, well, first of all, everything's got to go over the network connection. So latency can be a thing. You've gotta, right. You're going to want to make sure the server is close to the client and then they have a good, uh, reasonably fast network connection. Scale out is uh, is also going to be a significant issue because you're now running every connected client, every client that comes to your app, you're running their UI on your servers. So you're paying for that. You have to be able to handle all of those connections Hello. simultaneously. Okay. Any state that you want to be able to persist and rehydrate when the server gets you know recycled to apply a patch or whatever, those are now problems that you have to to deal with. Uh, and no, you don't get any offline support with the Blazor server model because you've got to have an active uh, c- connection. So those are all the things that the Blazor WebAssembly model is really good at. Like with Blazor on WebAssembly, you're leveraging the client process and all their CPU and all their memory to do all that work of running the UI. You can do offline some scenarios. You can turn it into a PWA. The downsides, of course, are that, well, you've got to download the WebAssembly runtime with your app. Fortunately, it's not, it's not that big. The default Blazor app, which has a, you know, a few pages in the runtime, is 2.4 megabytes compressed size, uh, the trans- transferred size right now for our default projects. We, there are things that we think we can still do to make that smaller, but that's right where we're sitting right now. Even when I do like a default Angular app, at least during development, Angular apps are like four or five megabytes. They, they tree shake down much, much smaller than that. But once you like pull in an image or any sort of data, you, you quickly break through that uh, that size barrier anyway. So it's it's not too bad, but there is there is that trade off that you you do have to download the runtime. If the browser that you care about supporting also doesn't support WebAssembly, then that can also be a, a consideration. Like 
you know, I'm going to say it. Uh, yeah. If you need to support IE, Blazor WebAssembly is not going to work for you because IE doesn't support WebAssembly and it's never going to support WebAssembly. Right. Uh, Blazor server apps, though, can be made to work on IE if you want to do that because all you need is the WebSocket connection. Yeah. So if somebody starts Blazor server side and then they want to switch to Blazor client side, is that going to take a lot of rework? or is No, it- actually, that is beautiful. It is a beautiful experience. So the, the component model is exactly the same. The way you write your components doesn't change. Now, you do have to be a little careful to make sure that the way you write your components, like your app logic, you have to make a choice if you're going to make it server-specific or uh, insulated against where it's currently hosted. So the way you typically do this is through dependency injection. Like you, if you want to get some data, like let's say you want to get some weather forecast data, that's the, uh, the sample that we have in our templates, you probably would want to define like an iWeather forecast service and then you do two implementations of it. One would be the server implementation that just talks to the database and gets the data. And then you have another implementation that does HTTP requests to to get the data. And then you inject that into your components and all the component knows is, oh, I need an iWeather forecast service. And then you inject the correct service depending on where you're you're currently hosted. So some of the um, samples we have demonstrate taking a single app and then you like either set an environment variable or you set a query string parameter or whatever, but then it flips to being either server side or client side, depending on you know the value of the query string parameter or the value of this environment variable, that is totally possible. You just have to have some discipline. If you want that, you have to be a little bit disciplined about how you write your your code. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, man, you're just—it's a lot to think about. <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of options there. One thing that that popped into my mind from a, a UI design standpoint, like right, like look and feel. Are you having to write all of your CSS from scratch or can you use existing frameworks like Bootstrap or Material? Can you leverage some of those other web-based components like you can currently? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, Blazor is C-sharp, but it's just HTML and CSS for the UI layer. Uh, Our templates by default are set up with Bootstrap 4. So we give you Bootstrap sort of out of the box. But you don't have to use Bootstrap with Blazor. There's no, there's no coupling there. It's just what the, we happen to use Bootstrap for everything else in ASP.NET Core right now. You can use Material Design if you want. And in fact, one thing you can do is you can build reusable components based on whatever particular design language you like. People have built component libraries of Material Design-based components that you can just install into your Blazor app as a NuGet package, and then you start using those components, and now you have Material Design-styled components in your application. If you want to use the Office Fabric-based design pattern, you can do that as well. The Blazor framework itself doesn't ship these libraries of components with the framework. The reason for that is because, like I said earlier, we want to create that space for the ecosystem and the community to, to just do great stuff, and it's been working pretty good. Like a, lo- a lot of these libraries already exist. A, a good, um, good community page I would point people to is uh, the Awesome Blazor site. Uh, I set okay. up a little short URL for it. It's uh, aka.ms slash Awesome Blazor. And all it is is one of those GitHub repos where someone collects links to all of the community projects around the Blazor space. And a lot of the projects they link to are either component libraries or helper libraries for like talking to the various browser APIs sample applications, and also a lot of really great learning materials. So if you're looking for some some library in the ecosystem, that's a good place to look. There are also the major component vendors that have decided to throw their hats into the ring and get, get involved. So Telerik and DevExpress and Syncfusion, uh, Radzen is another one. They all are shipping you know, commercial uh, component, component libraries that you can use with, their, with your app. And those libraries tend to have like a... a some sort of theming system that they they provide where you can kind of choose like which style of theming you want to use with that particular you know t- Telerik grid or DevExpress grid component or whatever. So there's actually quite a bit of choice in terms of how you manage what you know, the look and feel of your app uh, is like. When the component vendors jump on board, that tells me that you've arrived, right? Because they're not going to do it just for the fun of it. Right. <laughs> yeah, they, they yeah. have been great. They've been great to work with, too. Okay. Um, there's, there's some some Blazor fans in those in those companies as well. Like cool. Ed uh, Sharpeneau has has a really great uh, Twitch stream, if you haven't seen it, where he just, you know, I, don't, I think it's at least once a week, he'll just stream himself coding with Blazor and messing around with Blazor. 
they're pretty gung ho, and from what I hear, they seem pretty happy with uh, the uptake on their 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 Blazor UI offerings. That's great. So, so, can Blazor interact with other client side frameworks or like custom web components? So you can. What you can do from Blazor is, if you want to reuse, say, some existing JavaScript library, there's a JavaScript interrupt mechanism that you can call into, which allows you to call into JavaScript kind of as, as if it was C sharp. So you can include JavaScript libraries in your app. Like if you have some piece of code that you want to just reuse, and then you can invoke it from, from your Blazor application. And that JavaScript can also call back into your .NET application as well. Like if it has events or whatever, promises that complete, you can go the opposite direction as well. What's pretty common is actually people will take existing JavaScript assets that are popular, and they'll write a class library that uses the JavaScript interop layer to call into those uh, JavaScript libraries. And then they package it up as a, as a NuGet package where the JavaScript assets are either embedded with the, with the NuGet package or they tell you to go get it from, from NPM or wherever. And then you just install that library into your app and you're basically calling into the JavaScript functionality as if it's C Sharp. You get a .NET API for, for doing that, like a common cases where I've done this is like, let's say I want to call into local storage, like I want to put something into local storage, or I want to get the my current GPS location using the geolocation APIs. There are already NuGet packages that you can just install into an app. You call a .NET API, and it's handling all of that JavaScript interop logic under the covers. Now, if you're talking about, though, using Blazor with a more higher level framework, let's say like, like React or, or Angular, those can be used together in the same app, but they both are pretty possessive about the DOM. Like they're, they're all kind of doing the same thing where their components are rendering into an in-memory thing and then they're doing the diffing algorithm stuff. All those frameworks want to do that same thing. And that model assumes that no one else is messing with the DOM under the, the covers. So if you had Angular and Blazor looking at the same DOM elements and each assuming that they know what's going on, that, that, that's not going to work. You don't want to do that. But you could create like islands of functionality where you say, okay, I'm going to have some Angular stuff here at, at this element in this part of the page, and I'm going to have some Blazor stuff down here uh, in this part of the page. That, that can be made to, to work. Yeah, it's pointing to the upper left and the lower right of the... This is audio only. We're watching you. We know what you're pointing to, but you know, there's, you're pointing to different sections of the web page there. Yes. <laughs> um, my abstract web page is I talk with my hands on a podcast. <laughs> I, I do the same thing. I have one other question, and that's, uh, is there anything that people should know about how Blazor handles routing? Uh, we do support client-side routing. Like We have a client-side routing system. Normally, the way you interact with it is you define components and you put a directive at the top of the component to say what its route is. So it's, uh, we use the at page directive. So you have, a dot, you have a razor file, and at the top it says at page and then some route. And then the ra- there's a routing component that we uh, typically set up for you in the project that goes and finds all of the routable components. And then client side, when uh, the user is navigating around, it will then route the uh, rendering request to the correct component that has the corresponding uh, route to find on it. There is also uh, extensibility on the, the routing component where you can um, basically build your own, your own router if you'd like to do that, but that starts to get into more advanced scenarios. But uh, it is a full client-side routing-based uh, implementation. Okay. Well, I think we're going to start wrapping up. Uh, I do want to mention that uh, in the show notes, we're gonna, we'll add the link to Blazor, to the awesome Blazor you mentioned. I think you've also got NDC Oslo, the Gitter, we'll add all that to the show notes for people who are interested. One, one more link I'll add to your list is there's a really nice Blazor workshop that walks you through building a like pizza store application with Blazor. That's at aka.ms slash Blazor workshop. And it has full like, you know, uh, tutorial style description, you know, step-by-step instructions on how to build that app. That, that can be a lot of fun to build as well if you're looking to get your hands dirty with some Blazor. Awesome. So at the end of our shows, we typically do uh, picks, and the picks can be anything. It doesn't have to be .NET or programming related, uh, whatever you're interested in right now, whatever's tickling your fancy, so to speak. So uh, if you want, we'll, we'll go ahead, we'll go first, we'll give you a minute to think, think, think of something, <laughs> and then we'll come back to you. Do you want to go ahead, Sean? Sure. Since the end of Game of Thrones... I've been really kind of wanting to find something to satisfy my fantasy television watching itch, whatever. And I found a a series on Netflix. It's called Merlin. 
So if anybody, you know, likes fantasy TV, likes Arthurian legends and things like that, um, check out the TV series. There's five seasons of it on Netflix called Merlin. Cool. And my pick for this week is actually, um, it's a piece of technology called uh, Muse 2, M-U-S-E. It actually goes across your um, your forehead and sits on your ears. And it's a mindfulness meditation app that tracks your brain waves and your heart rate. And so you load up the app and then you, you try to, to meditate and it will actually, you know, listen to your body and tell you whether you're getting into a calm state or whether you, you're too active. I've had it for uh, for a little while now and, and uh, trying to be more mindful, right? <laughs> and uh, so far, so good. Cool. Wow. That, those are great. So I got to think of something good. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like the, I just came back from a vacation recently. And over that vacation, I was messing around with Roblox. Have you guys ever heard of Roblox? Yeah. You guys, if you have kids, you've probably heard of Roblox. Yes. Like my son had just uh, gone to a camp where he was learning game development with, with <laughs> Roblox. And I was looking at it, I was like, that looks great. And so I decided to mess around with it for a little while. And I had some ideas about trying to build like some educational style, style games. It's basically like a 3D gaming environment. But if you're looking for a way to like get your kids interested in programming or, or, or game development or, or UI design... It was it was pretty fun. I highly recommend it. So Roblox, I would uh, I would point you to all the, all you you people out there who want to get kids excited and interested in in software development. Awesome. Well, Dan, thank you for joining us today. It's been a, a really good uh, good discussion. Lots to think about. I need to start uh, tinkering with Blazor. Yeah, yeah, Blazor.net. That's that's where you go. It has been a lot of fun to talk about it. I, I enjoy talking about it, and uh, thank you so much for having me on the show. If people want to reach out to you, is there some way they can ask questions or anything like that? Yeah, sure. You can always uh, find me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is uh, DanRoth27. Awesome. So one other thing before we go, I want to remind people that if they want to reach out and get in touch with all the different channels on devchat.tv, talk to other people that listen to the podcasts or want to reach out to some of the hosts, go to devchat.tv and in the upper part of the screen, click on chat. And it'll take you to a Discord group for all the different uh, podcasts available on devchat.tv. All right, guys. Thank you. Good talk. Thanks, Dan. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more. 